Thank you very much for your uh, talk and presentation. Uh, so I'm James from Uganda. This is uh, Leonard from Germany, and that's Asel from Kazakhstan. So we will be giving you a commentary on your talk and also uh, based on the, the book chapter that we were meant to read. So this is going to be the uh, structure of our presentation. I'll start with a brief summary and critique of the, of the book chapter, and then we'll, we'll have current debates on the issue of debt and some aspects of odious debt, and then a specific case of uh, Chinese debt trap diplomacy, and then end with questions. Okay, so um, the book chapter that we read actually explores the concept of illegitimate debt in a very well-structured uh, historical development of debt from the 1960s up to debt. Um, and then there's a focus on looming debt in the global south, particularly in Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean. And however, one important aspect that is pointed out is that debt is now a tool of uh, neo-colonial imperialism and in that way, it, uh, it's a very big obstacle to meeting uh, basic needs and limiting progress in human development in many of these countries that are subjected uh, to debt. So uh, this is a table that is extracted from the book chapter and it based on World Bank data. World Bank data. Um, and if you look at the, the, the numbers, they're really extraordinary. From the 1980s, if you look at the next five decades, the amount of debt that, that uh, Latin America, Caribbean, Sub-Saharan Africa, Middle East, uh, North Africa, South Asia, East Asia, the Pacific, Central Asia, more than tripled. And this is a very uh, significant uh, point to note. So um, to give a critique of the, of the chapter, so like I mentioned, it actually, we, it was a quite a good read because uh, even though it was a brief chapter, it actually covers a lot of ground in a very well-structured, uh, clear elaboration of debt evolution over the years. And I was particularly impressed because the argumentation considers examples from both uh, the Global North, for instance, Greece, uh, Portugal, Iceland, and the Global South with cases of Mexico, Haiti, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Particularly, the concept of odious debt stands out in this chapter. And I will reiterate, I know you already mentioned what it actually is, but I'll reiterate this and say that uh, based on uh, Sachs' uh, definition, he says that debt is considered odious or illegitimate if it, if it uh, fulfills these two uh, conditions. One is that if the debt is incurred not in the interest of the people, the population, and secondly, that there is lender's complicity, which means that the lender has foreknowledge that the debt will not benefit uh, the population. So when those two criteria are met, it is considered to be uh, odious or illegitimate. Now, um, to look at it from another side, to critique this idea of odious debt, uh, based on the literature, there is actually a difficulty, like you also mentioned in your presentation, to clearly categorize debt as being either legitimate or illegitimate. And also the definition in international law is quite uh, contentious, at least as stated by Chantran and uh, Kramer in 2006. Uh, particularly, some of the issues that are concerned in the determination of odious debt, and like you already mentioned also in your uh, in your presentation, I think you had some foresight in what I was going to say, is that there is the aspect of inherited debt. So how do you determine whether that debt is odious or not? With a specific example of the, uh, the apartheid government in South Africa between 1948 and the 1990s, to what extent is the debt that they incurred while in power considered odious, given that uh, they might not have been uh, do, uh, in the interest of the majority, but they actually were, in a sense, a legitimate government. So does that concept of odious debt still stand? 
The other is the, the issue of um, what happens when a, a political regime, a good regime in government, turns bad or when one that is good actually reforms. For instance, Mobutu's government in Zaire that came in, um, uh, came in power with uh, legitimate, uh, leg leg legitimate reasons and after a while it turned corrupt. But in that uh, time frame, they were incurring uh, debt. So where is the line? Where is the line drawn between at what point is the debt set, set as odious or not? Given that at, at one point, the government was working in favor or in the interest of the population, but then after a while, it turned. So um, another pressing issue is that this as idea of pushing the... Um, the responsibility to the creditor as well of lenders' complicity. It impacts the issue of the borrowing costs. So in terms of high interest rates, given that there will be increased risks for the creditors themselves. Um, and based on that, I pose the question, uh, particularly for the countries that, uh, whose budget is mostly financed by this, uh, by debt. So the heavily indebted poor countries. So how realistic is it for heavily indebted poor countries to opt out of paying the seemingly illegitimate debt, given that it would ruin their reputation in terms of their credit worthiness uh, when accessing debt in future? Thank you. I will now uh, continue with a, a little side question that arose then when we uh, read into um, odious debt, and that's um, the discussion um, represented by the two people that we can see here on the left hand, Mohamed Banjawi and Alexander Sack, that you already mentioned yourself. Alexander Sack is the creator of uh, Odious Debt, as you explained, and as we've heard now. And they do represent two positions on the question of odious colonial debt, so the stake succession in the case of uh, co colonial states, whereas um, Bedjawi uh, re um, represents the, the side of the clean slate theory, which would say that a newly independent country should not inherit any debt of the pre-colonial, uh, of the colonial past, whereas Alexander Sack, which you... Um, yeah, I mentioned yourself, he um, argued in favor of like a more differentiated approach according to the odious debt doctrine, which would say that only those debts that have actually been, been uh, adverse towards the population of the colonized um, peoples, only that would be the legitimate debt. So the resulting question would be, do you think that all debt at the point of independence is odious debt or like which of the two positions do you hold? And we will now uh, leave the the historical sphere and like go more into like current debates and like uh, introduce a couple of them in order to um, spur a debate afterwards. So the, um, before we we enter like more specific ones, I just wanted to highlight the current dynamics, like taking stop of the the very uh, situation that we're in right now. Here we can see uh, the total um, sovereign debt um, in percentage of GDP. This concerns low-income countries. This is not of the whole world. But what we can see is like a stark drop in the 2003, 5, 7. That was like a partly um, by uh, like a debt cancellation campaign by uh, IMF and World Bank, where they had several programs where they cancelled that. And now we can see um, from 2019 onwards like a, a rise again. And this is also represented in the uh, following graph where we can, on the right hand, uh, hand see uh, the, the debt service cost um, in relation to social spending. And again, we can see that like the debt service cost is going up again um, lately. And the same can be seen in uh, the, this graph where we can see the external debt service, so the cost of, um, of credit in relation to revenue, so roughly the budget of, of, um, of governments. Only to say we are, only to support the claim that we are again in a, in a looming debt crisis or an ongoing um, and coming debt crisis. I would now look at one, um, like, a little bit shift the, the, the focus, and this is a quote of yours in the paper that we've read, that became the principal instrument used to impose neo-colonialist uh, 
relations and I think in the way you portrayed it, it is quite clear. Um, however, today we can see that the constellation of creditors has changed. So, whereas in the 80s, 90s, we can see that the creditors were mostly um, Japan, Germany, France, United States, which falls in line roughly with like um, the colonial relationship um, 100 years before, or like not even, not even 100 years. Um, and on the right side, we can see the um, the, the newer like uh, the constellation of creditors today. And what we can see, like unfortunately, the quality is really bad. But um, what we can see is that China and India entered entered the game. So. Um, um, not like the colonial powers as like before. And the same can we see in, um, here, like this is uh, bilateral creditors, so between countries. And here we can see um, like in general, like um, creditors. And again, the same kind of um, diversification of creditors. So previously it was quite clear, Japan, like the Global North, and IMF and World Bank being the main creditors to, to Global South countries or um, low-income countries, whereas on the right side, we can see that China, the Asian Development Bank and the African Development Bank have entered the gain, uh, game and again a diversification. And um, so the resulting question is, do you think the current creditor constellation is still colonial? And what is your definition of colonial or colonial debt? Um, yeah. Um, then now I want to highlight something that James has already mentioned. So you say it is possible not to pay an illegitimate debt. And um, there's a whole literature on the effects of not paying like on sovereign default. And just to summarize it, it's not very clear. So uh, the, the evidence is uh, very, very ambiguous but there is like only to select a certain like this is a very select bias selection but what i want to highlight here is that there is a risk that there is a risk when you don't pay your debt and um what like these two um quotes say is so most importantly the the lower one that there is a higher um, subsequent bond yield spread when you um have a debt default and that you're excluded from the capital market, as James had already said. And what like, I want to hear, based on this, I focus on a little bit of a different question. And I hope I don't mischaracterize you if I assume that you're also partly an activist in favor of like, uh, the cancellation of debt. And here my question would be, do you think that as an activist, one should be taken responsible for the potential negative consequences of one's demands? Or in other words, like if we if we pose certain demands, in this case the cancellation of debt, should we have these potential negative consequences in mind? And then, thirdly, a very very small topic, uh, big topic, but just like a, uh, <laughs> a quick quick uh, insertion in order to discuss this later is that like currently there are proposals for so, uh, so called debt for climate swaps which would be a debt relief based on a commitment by the, com uh, by, by the government uh, to invest in certain like climate related or um, nature protection related um, projects. And there is a like lively ongoing debate and um, our question would be what's your, what's your stance on it? And now uh, we would like to a uh, little bit dig into one particular aspect of the discussion on geopolitical architecture of debt, which is uh, the so-called debt threat diplomacy of China. Thank you. Uh, and we will also show you all the questions in the very end, in one slide. And now we will take a look at debt threat diplomacy, but I will start by introducing the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, the BRI, launched by, by China in 2013, uh, is a vast global development uh, strategy and uh, it's, it focuses on funding infrastructure projects, uh, primarily in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, and to date, 147 countries, which is around two thirds of the world's population, have signed on to projects, onto BRI projects, or indicated an interest in doing so. And the BRI is closely tied to uh, debt dynamics. And for example, in 1998, China's loan credit stood at almost zero. But in 2018, the figure stood at a massive 1.6 trillion US dollars. And what were these loans for? Uh, 
range of infrastructure projects uh, without immediate return, such as energy projects in Pakistan, dams in Myanmar, railway lines in Africa. So this all has transformed China into the largest official creditor. Um, however, a considerable portion of China's uh, loans, China government loans, uh, has gone to nations already in debt distress. And this raises a debate. Um, on the one side, Western, some Western countries uh, view it as a strategy to burden countries with unmanageable loans, making them susceptible to uh, Chinese influence. While in contrast, others argue that uh, these projects, infrastructure projects, are driven by demand uh, of the recipient countries, and these infrastructure projects otherwise would be unfunded, uh, especially in developing countries. But is there enough evidence to think so? And the prime example is a uh, Sri Lanka's port of Hambantota, which has been underutilized uh, and uh, being unable to repay loans to China, uh, Sri Lanka gave the majority of their shares to a Chinese state-owned company of, on a 99-year lease of, in exchange for $1.12 trillion. And the U.S. claims that this is a Chinese plan to entrap countries in debt, uh, then to use it to seize assets. Uh, but... Um, Initial feasibility report was done by a Canadian engineering firm, but this Canada-dominated project was uh, it, it failed and it was rejected. But lately, but later, uh, the Danish engineering firm uh, in 2006 uh, made a similar um, uh, rich report with um, positive recommendations. And with this report, China, uh, oh, Sri, Sri Lanka approached uh, the U.S. and India both of which declined. However, this was the time when Chinese construction firm stepped in and the China Exim Bank offered Sri Lanka a 15-year commercial loan of 307 million US dollars at a 6.3% fixed interest rate, which is much lower with which is much lower compared to other interest rates by given by other countries. Uh, secondly, China accounts for only 10% of Sri Lanka's total debt. Uh, as for the concerns about tri uh, China trying to seize uh, continent-wide debts, actually around 20% of African government debts are owed to China. However, interest rates tend to be higher on private sector loans, which therefore accounts for 55% of interest payments compared to China, which accounts for 17% of interest payments. Uh, the John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies curates a database on China's loans, and there are around 1,000 loans in Africa, but so far no evidence of uh, extracting uh, benefits such as asset seizures and there are similarly around 3,000 cases in the whole world of how some projects have been cancelled totally or renegotiated uh, by China. Uh, also several public or uh, several organizations such as BBC World Public Opinion polls uh, conducted surveys in Africa and they found out that the majority of the population have favorable opinions in, of China as an economic model and an attractive partner for their development. Uh, for example, 65% in Kenya, 76% in Ghana and 85% in the Africa's most populous country, Nigeria, have indicated favorable uh, attitudes towards China. However, uh, even though public in those developing countries tend to have uh, positive attitudes, criticism of the BRI often overlooks domestic, uh, overlook domestic consequences uh, in China, such as corruption, financial issues, xenophobia. So there is a perception that the ordinary people uh, in China itself do not significantly benefit from the state strategies. Uh, also, there is a criticism that China lacks uh, transparency, especially in terms of loan amount, interest rates, repayment terms, and the overall debt obligations of recipient countries. So, while China lend China's lending practices uh, tend to uh, raise a lot of concerns and criticism, they 
also play a crucial role in providing uh, infrastructure to um, in addressing infrastructure and development needs in various countries but the most important that this debate over debt trap diplomacy highlights the need for greater transparency and fair lending practices and now I want to ask an open question are these Chinese debts odious in the sense that they compromise the sovereignty and financial stability of debt nations or are they a necessary tool for development and now we will ask other questions. Um, yes, just to summarize all the questions in one slide, uh, I'll just repeat them for your convenience. How realistic is it for heavily indebted poor countries to opt out of paying seemingly illegitimate debt, given that it would ruin their reputation, especially in terms of credit worthiness when accessing debt in the future? Secondly, do you think all debt at, at the point of independence, uh, so-called colonial debt, is odious debt? And are you aware of the estimations of the level of debt at the time of the colony's independence? Thirdly, do you think that as an activist, one should be taken responsible for potential negative consequences of demands? What, are your, what is your stance on debt for climate swaps? Do you think the current creditor constellation is still colonial? If so, what is your definition of colonial debt? And lastly, considering historical role of debt in enforcing economic and political control, do you consider China's current lending practices as colonial? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, comments and uh, for the questions. So, uh, I will to see the, to re review the question. <laughs> the first question, uh, it, this question take as an evidence that uh, suspending the payment of the debt or repudiating debt will uh, cut the possibility for a country to have access to uh, uh, lenders. I think that this uh, this uh, vision is uh, is wrong. We have a lot of cases which shows that after a debt cancellation or after a debt repudiation, uh, you will have a situation in which several lenders will want to lend more money. Because the, the thinking or uh, the, the way of thinking of a lender is if the country is in better condition because he succeeds to reduce uh, in, in an important way his foreign debt, he is in better condition to take new debt and to be capable to pay back this debt. Uh, you mentioned several uh, uh, authors like uh, Carmen Reinhardt, uh, Trebesch. I know very well the, the uh, conception, the studies. I am reading all what they are uh, producing. But they have a dogma. It, it is the, the dogma is the country should uh, take debt on financial market. Its credit worthiness is absolutely fundamental. And if he stop the payment of he, if he repudiate debt, he will not have any more access to the market or he will, he, sh he will have to pay uh, 
more risk premium to get uh, to have access to new debt. And this uh, uh, affirmation are not demonstrated by the real life. Uh, uh, I, I recommend to you to read other authors, including authors like uh, uh, Joseph Stiglitz, Nobel Prize of Economy, uh, who say that uh, in a collective work, I, I can send you the, the link to this collective uh, work published by uh, a, a British university. He, he said the suspension of payment, unilateral suspension of payment, is the beginning of the recuperation of the economy and of the growth of the country. And he take several examples, including, for instance, Argentina, after the decision of Argentina to suspend the payment of the debt uh, at the end of uh, December 2001. The, to complete my answer to this uh, question, I, I would say I'm not sure that the way of financing uh, heavily poor country a uh, heavily indebted poor country is uh, by the financial markets. I think that there are other alternative ways of financing development. Another way of taxing the activity of the corporation who are extracting the commodities of the country, so increasing the taxes on, uh, paid by this uh, uh, Corporation, so increasing the fiscal revenue of uh, of the the country, also strangling against corruption, against the uh, uh, the, the 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 wealth which is uh, uh, evaded by the the elites of the country and. and uh, uh, which are on the bank accounts in the north, etc. There is way to recover this money. We have, as an uh, organization uh, like the CDM, CDTM, we, we have uh, helped countries to recover that uh, from uh, Swiss, Swiss bankers and uh, other bankers with the, the collaboration of the justice of these uh, countries. Um, so that's the, my first answer, the or, or element of answer to the first uh, question. Uh, second question is very simple. Yes, I think that at, at the moment of the independence, all the debt uh, uh, taken by the colonial powers should be cancelled. So I share the point of view of Bejawi, Bejawi who uh, was an Im important ju jurist. He is still uh, uh, he is living here in Paris, um, Bejawi, but it's very difficult to meet him. He is very old now. But uh, I share fully his view that uh, all the uh, colonial debt at the moment of the independence uh, should be uh, cancelled. Uh, third question, of course, I, I think that as an activist uh, that uh, uh, we should be taken responsible for potential negative consequences of demands. Yes, of course, uh, we should make recommendations uh, which are really uh, in favor of the interest of the people and uh, the country. And uh, answering the first question, I also uh, think that I am coherent uh, with this position because I am convinced that uh, the argument 
saying that uh, suspending the payment or repudiating debt will cut the country from the market. Uh, I, because I am convinced that this is not the main problem for a country, uh, I am convinced that it is uh, in favor of the country. And so it is not, uh, it will not have the so-called negative consequences of such demands. Um, I, yesterday I was giving, a, a, I was invited to the National Assembly, so to the French Parliament, by the, uh, and I make a presentation yesterday morning, uh, after being introduced by the President of the uh, Commission des Finances, Financial Commission of the National Assembly uh, in the, of this country. And I said that uh, uh, the, the Argentinian, go Argentinian government in the years 2010 asked me to advise the country. And I tried to make some, to give some advice. And we didn't uh, reach a, a, a common vision. But what I told to the to the Argentinian government. In, in this epoch, when Argentina decided to suspend the payment, so the, the Argentinian government took this decision at the end of 2001. And uh, it was the beginning of the recuperation of the growth of the country. When it takes this decision, the country was in recession uh, since 33 months, a very long recession, okay? And uh, thanks to the decision of suspending the payment on $60 billion to commercial banks and uh, financial market, the annual uh, rate of growth was 8% in 2003, 2004, 5, 6, 7. So the growth of Argentina, thanks to the suspension of the payment, was very uh, efficient. But the Minister of Finances, well, his name was Boudou, uh, uh, was convinced that it was absolutely fundamental for Argentina to go back to the market and to issue new bonds on the market. And in this epoch, because of the suspension of the payment, Argentina had no access to the market. And I told the minister, why do you want to go back to the market? You have an annual growth of 8% uh, because you are capable to use alternative finances to uh, the finances uh, you can find uh, on the financial markets. So why do you have this obsession to make an agreement with the, uh, with the Paris Club to have the possibility after that to go back to the financial market? Um, and so he did. He didn't agree with me, and so we decided not to collaborate. But I think he was wrong. And what happened after that, when they go back, when they make the agreement, Argentina made its agreement with the Paris Club in 2013, began to uh, issue new bonds on financial markets, entered in uh, uh, negotiation with the bond holders that began to enter newly in a new debt crisis and now Argentina is fully in a very uh, huge and, and very dangerous debt crisis. Uh, my stance on debt for climate 
swaps. If you go to the CRDTM website, you will show as CRDTM we have a very clear position, very critical uh, on the debt for climate swaps. We analyze what are really uh, these uh, swaps and we show that uh, uh, it is not favorable to the, the country uh, who are uh, accepted this type of uh, swaps. Now, recently Gabon uh, made an agreement of a, a debt for climate swap and we analyzed it and we showed that it, it was a very bad uh, agreement. Um, I will not enter in the detail because it's, it, 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 uh, I would say we, we, sh we should take the time to discuss uh, exactly uh, uh, and analyze what are the uh, negative points of uh, the debt for climate swaps. But if you send me an email, I can send you several uh, articles we have written on, on that question. Uh, now, I don't think that, that there is still colonial debt. They are old colonial debt, but the, the new form of domination, or uh, I, would, I, I will not name them colonial. I, I, I will say, and for instance, in the case of the debt to China, that uh, a big part of the debt reclaimed by China to debtors country are illegitimate, illegitimate and odious debt. I am just now uh, writing a, a, a study on, uh, on that question. Uh, I am against the type of diabolization of China that uh, Washington is doing another government because they are in a, a confrontation with China. Uh, uh, but uh, it is clear that China with uh, BRI is repro reproducing the same model. It's extractivism, export-led model. Uh, what are they building? They are building roads, ports, uh, airports, uh, 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 power station for what? For extracting minerals, uh, for exporting commodities to China. Uh, they are not uh, building uh, uh, laboratories, hospitals, uh, manufacturing uh, uh, plants to transform commodities into uh, 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 manufactured uh, product, etc. So China is reproducing what the uh, traditional imperialist uh, powers uh, have done in the, the periphery and it will uh, um, strengthened the subordination and marginalization of the countries who are taking loans in such condition from China. And uh, well, well, the, the, it is very uh, uh, problematic to see that Africa is still considered either by the US or by France or by Great Britain or by China as a uh, continent uh, which is interesting to extract uh, minerals and to export to the, to the world market uh, and not to uh, help Africa to have an endogenous model of development and to transform their own 
uh, natural resources in, in the benefit of the population of, of Africa. So I am very critical uh, in relation with the Chinese uh, uh, policy and I made that uh, uh, very public, but I will not enter in a denunciation in China in favor of what Washington or Paris are doing in, the, in Africa or in Latin America on, or in Asia. So you take the, you take the example of uh, this port in Sri Lanka, as you I imagine know, now Washington has decided to finance uh, alternatively the port of Colombo and to give uh, loans to the authority of Sri Lanka in competition with China. It's not a solution for Sri Lanka. Uh, what uh, Washington is, is proposing. So I hope that I have answered your question and really uh, I thank you for your comments and your question. Thank you so much. <laughs> How much time do we have left? Seven minutes. Okay, so I would propose to have like two very small questions if there are any in the room. Okay, <laughs> that's more than two questions. Um, the two of you. Uh, thank you. I'm Camille from France. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask regarding the rise of financialization. Can you speak louder? Sorry. Regarding the rise of fi financialization and shadow banking, what would be the, um, the impact of um, no, like, um, um, cancelling debt uh, regarding the risk on financial market? Like, is there a risk? Like, mm. um, like now, um, many countries um, have local currency bonds, but uh, this also uh, serve as collateral for many um, financing tools, so there will, is there a risk for financial market if we uh -huh. cancel the debt? Um, hi, I'm Yaksh from India. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I was wondering if currency hierarchy had a role to play in uh, exacerbating the colonial role that higher currencies have to play in kind of a neo-imperialistic debt trap because if we fundamentally look at how debt is measured on the international financial market, it's almost always in the terms of the United States dollar. And especially countries which borrow internationally on a non-fixed exchange rate, it could be a future market, it could be a, a floating exchange rate. A lot of them tend to suffer when exchange rates uh, change because interest rates worsen in such situations. Uh, do you think this could further uh, an imperialistic tendency from the United States uh, because their country's currency is hegemonic? Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> given that we have like five minutes left, I would propose to, for you to answer the questions now and for everybody else to ask the questions afterwards in person. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so very short. The risk for the financial market is very uh, limited because the, the amount of the periphery, peripheral debt or third world debt is very uh, marginal at the level of uh, the, the debt at a world scale. So the, if you take into account all the external debt of the all, the total public external debt of sub-Saharan Africa is 25% of the public debt of France. Hmm? Uh, so it's uh, the, the level 
of the third world debt is very limited. So a full cancellation, uh, the, the impact on the financial market would be very, uh, very marginal. So the risk is, is null, I would say. At the level of uh, the, 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 the question of uh, the Indian uh, colleague, it's really complicated to, to give a short answer. You, you, what you have uh, described as a, a problematic is, is correct. And uh, um, the question of succeeding in delinking from the dollar is uh, vital. But it's at the same time absolutely clear that the dollars still dominate the, the relation. On that question, China in some way is changing in some way the rules because China is giving loans in renminbi increasingly and uh, because renminbi is recognized by the IMF as a um, money to pay back the IMF the loans given by China in renminbi are acceptable to, to give you a concrete example the half of the foreign reserve of Argentina are in renminbi <coughs> and uh, Ch China is giving loans to Argentina which, uh, with which Argentina pay back the IMF. So uh, the China at this level is uh, gaining some power in its relation with the US and the uh, domination of the dollars. But uh, the domination of the dollars will uh, go for, I think, for a long time uh, because uh, the domination is really uh, huge. I'll finish. Okay. <laughs>